are visiting with us. You, you've caught us an exciting time uh, because we've been going through the book of Acts that records the history of our early brothers and sisters. Last time we gathered together, we studied out chapters 1 through 8. Today, we're going to be looking at Acts chapters 9 through 15. Now, we're going to be skipping over some sections, but prayerfully, those sections were covered in your first principles classes. The title of our lesson today comes actually from Matthew chapter 11, when Jesus said, From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing, and forceful men lay hold of it. Amen. Our title, Forcefully Advancing the Kingdom. Our first point, zeal for the truth. Let's look at Acts chapter 9, verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting, he replied. Now get up. And go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They, they heard the sound, but they didn't see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So he led him by his hand to Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Right here we see the Pharisee Saul, who was out to kill and destroy as many disciples and the church as he could, was on his way to Damascus when Jesus himself appears to him in a bright light. It was so bright, he simply falls to the ground. The Bible says right here that the people heard the sound that were with him, but they didn't see Jesus himself. Only Saul saw Jesus. And yet when he got up off the ground, the Lord had struck him blind. And he was in this condition, the Bible says, for three days. And of course, we understand quite clearly right here that Saul was perhaps the most zealous person and enemy of the church. And yet now, God had struck him blind so that he could see that he was in the darkness. That he could see that he could not see. And it was for three days Days that he was in the darkness, stamping indelibly upon Saul's mind that Jesus was dead for three days. And on the third day, he resurrected, and the church said, Amen. Let's read on. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he's praying. In a vision, he's seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. So right here, God speaks to Ananias. He says, there is a man waiting for you. He's praying and he's fasting. And you know, I think it's a good thing before anybody gets baptized, they pray and they fast. Amen, guys? Verse 13. Lord Ananias answered, I've heard of many reports about this man and all the harm he's done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he's come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. How would you like that calling? Well, that's the calling you have. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. And so Ananias was obedient to the vision. He was obedient to the Spirit. He goes to Saul, and he finds that he is indeed blind, he has the gift of healing, so he lays his hands on Saul, and scales fall from his eyes, and he could see again. And then the Bible says that he was baptized, and that's how he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. 
You know, it's interesting that God took this man, Saul, and gave him such a great charge, such a great destiny. And in some ways, it was everything you would have expected him not to be destined for. And yet, God had a vision for him that could only be accomplished through suffering. You know, when you think about it, you have to examine your own conversion. I think back to my conversion. My parents, neither one of them, believed in Jesus. I was raised in a home that there was no talk about the Bible or spiritual things. I got involved in a fundamental Methodist church during my high school years and, and was very active in it. And came to a faith in Christ and deep convictions. And yet, when I got to college, my convictions started to wane. And it was just at that time that a true Christian came into my life and invited me to church. When he first shared with me how to become a Christian, just like Paul right here, you had to have faith, you had to repent, and you had to be baptized. I was upset because I had been taught that all I needed to do to be a Christian was just pray Jesus into my heart. And yet, bottom line, after a day, I saw this is the truth in God's word. And that was when I made my decision to be baptized into Christ. You know, a lot of times when we're first confronted with the truth, it's almost too hard to accept. And right here, I mean, Paul was wrestling with it. I mean, he had killed Christians. He had that deep of convictions that Jesus was not the way. And now after three days of prayer and fasting, he becomes a baptized disciple of Jesus Christ. Let's look at his early days as a Christian. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once, he began to preach in the synagogue that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem amongst all those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to see priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. You know, a lot of times people ask me, bro, how do I grow spiritually? Well, right here, Paul shows even from being a young disciple, he says he spent time with the disciples. And the Bible says at once he began to preach the word. You want to grow spiritually? Get out there and preach the word. Amen. You say, well, I don't, I don't know if I'll be able to handle everybody's questions. Well, that'll drive you into the Word. That'll drive you into the life of stronger Christians so that you will want to learn the answers to these things and you will grow more and more powerful just like your brother Saul. Amen? Amen. Verse 23. After many days had gone by, the Jews conspired to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by the night And lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. You know, Paul references that time in his life in 2 Corinthians 11.32 as a time of weakness. I mean, they were out to kill him. And yet, Paul says, man, it was kind of humiliating. Here I was, this fireball. And then they had to lower me down (laughs) in a basket. He was, if you will, the first basket case in the Bible. (laughs) And sometimes, spiritually speaking... When strong opposition comes our ways, we become a basket case, don't we? And Paul understood that it was even during in this time of weakness, that is when he depended on the Lord. Now, very interestingly, the next thing that Luke records through the Spirit is this. When Saul came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing he really was a disciple. I mean, they couldn't believe it. This was such an incredible, unbelievable conversion. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. This is an interesting passage because as we're going to see, the length of time between verse 25 and verse 26 is three years. Let's go to Galatians chapter 1. Remember how verse 26 starts. When Paul came to Jerusalem. Paul shares about his early days as a disciple in Galatians chapter 1. Beginning in verse 11. 
I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel I preach is not something that man made up. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. Now, a lot of people infer that this was the moment that Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus. Certainly, it was inclusive of that, but that's not exactly what he was referring to. Let's read on. Verse 13. For you have heard from my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and how I tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many Jews of my own age and was extremely zealous for the tradition of my fathers. But when God, who set me apart from birth and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not consult any man. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was. But I went immediately into Arabia and later returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Peter and stayed with him 15 days. Right here are some powerful concepts. Verse 15, Paul understood that he had been set apart from birth for his destiny. Do you have that sense about your life? Just as truly as God wove the DNA inside of Paul's mom's womb, surely he did the same thing for you. You have a destiny. And yet you're never going to fulfill your destiny until you accept God's grace. And notice right here, he makes a point of it again. He says, I didn't consult any man, nor did I go up to Jerusalem, verse 17, to talk to the apostles. But I went immediately into Arabia. Wow. Arabia is only used two times in the entire New Testament. And the other time that it's used is in this same book. So let's see what Arabia meant to Paul. Turn to Galatians. Chapter 4. He's making analogies between Hagar and Sarah. But we're going to pick up this in verse 25. Now Hagar stands, stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. And we understand, of course, the whole concept of Hagar giving birth to Ishmael versus, of course, um, Sarah giving birth to Isaac and the true lineage of the people of God. But right here, Paul allows us to understand why he went to Arabia. What was special in Arabia? He's clearly right here, Mount Sinai. What was special about Mount Sinai? Well, we know from the scriptures in Exodus chapter 19, Mount Sinai is where Moses went to receive the revelation of God, of the law for the Israelite people. Is that awesome or not? Sometimes, you know, we, we kind of maybe lose our sense of who Paul was. I mean, he was the Moses of that day. He didn't consult any man. He says, I know I need to talk to God. And so he leaves Damascus immediately. And he goes to the very mountain of God, Mount Sinai. And there he receives the revelation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it isn't interesting that it's a three-year period from that time in Mount Sinai as well as his other wanderings before he gets to Jerusalem. Of course, that three-year period is the same length of time that Jesus spent with the, quote, other disciples. And so we understand that Paul received his revelation in three years' time, just as the other disciples had been able to get it when Jesus was in the flesh. Amen, guys? Let's get on back to our text. So we find that Paul goes up to Jerusalem. Even after three years, they go, I can't believe you're really a disciple. He says, that's, that's how much of a transition in his life that he made. Well, he, he starts causing all sorts of persecution, and so they send him back off to Tarsus, where he was from. And then we read in verse 31. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. 
It was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It grew in numbers, living in the fear of the Lord. Now, remember the charge, the great commission that Jesus gave in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He told, he prophesied, he commanded that the apostles take the gospel from Jerusalem, that's where the church started, to all Judea and Samaria, and from there to the ends of the earth. Well, here we are in Acts chapter 9, and already the gospel has gotten to Judea and Samaria. Amen? Well, let's move on. And we're going to talk about zeal to preach. If you have zeal for the truth, if you really know the truth, and we know that we have the truth through the word of God, amen, guys? Then you're going to have a zeal to preach it. In Acts 10 and the first part of Acts chapter 11, we have the account, of course, of Cornelius and the fact that God brought the gospel to the Gentiles. Now, for the first seven years of Christianity, the only people that became Christians were the Jews. They thought they were the only ones entitled to have the Messiah. And so we pick up the reading, and you'll understand it better now, in verse 19 of chapter 11. A zeal to preach. Now, those who have been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, Antioch, telling the message only to Jews. Now, remember back in Acts chapter 8, verse 4, the apostles decided to stay in Jerusalem, even in the midst of all the persecution. Even after Stephen was martyred, they decided we're staying because Jesus commanded them to stay. But then they sent out the other disciples to preach the word. Amen, guys? So here's what happened. Verse 20. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the ears of the church of Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man. Full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus, looked for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Right here was an amazing moment for the early church. Up to this point, only Jews had become Christians, and then some of the wild disciples from Cyprus and Cyrene, they started, they were so excited. They started talking to the Gentiles. Well, praise God, the apostles had the revelation that, hey, the Gentiles can be saved too. And that's good for most all of us in the room here, except for Ken Zindler, amen, being our resident Jew guy here. And so the Bible says, yeah, the, the, the Jews had a tendency to be resistant. But the Gentiles were so open that a great number of people believed, and turned to the Lord. And the Bible says, when Barnabas got up there, he saw the evidence of the grace of God. Well, what is the evidence of the grace of God? Yes, it's transformed lives of even wild Gentiles, but it's the great numbers of people that are coming around. Go, whoa! The grace of God is evidenced in this place. And he says, man, the work, there's so many people coming around. You know, when the Bible says, that a great number of people are brought to the Lord, it means that. Many historians believe that the church in Antioch grew to become somewhere between 25,000 to 50,000 disciples. Now, that's a great number of people. And that's exactly what the Bible said. Amen, guys? And Barnabas goes, man, I need somebody to help. I need someone by my side. I need someone zealous. I need somebody that knows the Word of God really well. To help these unlearned Gentile people. (laughs) Saul. And so he goes about 100 miles to Tarsus and searches for Saul. I suspect it wasn't too hard to find him. That's where all the yelling was at. That's where you'd find (laughs) Saul. Brings him back. And they preach the word. And the Bible says, this is the place That the disciples were first called Christians. See, Christians is kind of a nickname the world gave 
the disciples. You're the Christians. You're the followers of Christ. See, we need to understand, biblically speaking, that if you're not a disciple of Jesus Christ, and Jesus defines that quite clearly. Yeah, deny yourself, take the cross daily, and follow him. Amen? You've got to love Jesus more than your father, your mother, your wife, your brother, your sisters, yet even your own life. Or you can't be a disciple. you got to give up everything or you can't be a disciple. If you're not a disciple, you're not a Christian. Because in the Bible, a disciple and a Christian were synonymous. In our American culture, we sometimes think, well, there's Christians and then there are disciples, the real committed Christians. No, 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 no. In the Bible, you're either a Christian and a disciple or you are not. Are you with me right here, church? Well, I mean, they're preaching the word and, and they're teaching. And then we find this. During this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them named Agabus stood up and through the spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman Empire. This happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples, each according to his ability, decided to provide help for the brothers living in Judea. This they did, sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. Right here, we see the love of the disciples from one church to another church. As a matter of fact, it's the younger church. It's a Gentile church that hears about the needs in Jerusalem and they want to take up a collection to help them. That was just their heart. We don't exactly know the date, but we know the date of the famine. And it was a very, very severe famine. The famine lasted from 41 to 45 AD. And it was particularly harsh amongst the Israelites for many political reasons as well. But nonetheless, when the disciples in Antioch, and Antioch was such a rich city, it was the beginning of what they would later call the Silk Road to India and to China. It's a super rich city. And so these disciples who had more than their poor brothers and sisters down in Jerusalem, they hear the condition of it, and they says, you know something? We need to take up a collection in order to help our brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. And the Bible says that each disciple gave according to his ability. It wasn't just a couple of disciples giving. Every single one of the Antioch disciples gave. No matter how rich or how poor, they all gave. That's the heart of the early Christians. You know, today we're going to have our, our Thanksgiving missions contribution. Amen, guys? And this message contribution is going to allow us to do things that, well, first we hadn't planned on. We hadn't planned on the Kostinkos coming here from Moscow, Russia. But you know, when Elena and I got with them in May on our, on our world trip, they had absolutely nothing except the desire to rebuild God's church. And in one night, I said, bro, sis, how about you come and join us in Los Angeles? And they said, yes, we would come. And we've been sacrificing in order to support them here, to strengthen them in the Lord, so that the Lord can move powerfully again in Moscow and in all the 15 nations of the former Soviet Union. Amen, guys? We hadn't planned to send out the San Diego mission team, but you know something? The Holy Spirit is sending it on out. Amen, guys? And so with these needs, now we're going to have to help disciples, so to speak, in other places. This isn't something we should feel burdened to do. We should be excited. And we've asked each person to give four times the amount. Well, you're the one that set the pledge, so you've decided to give according to your ability right here. And we're asking you to give that to further God's kingdom. See, in the Bible, there was no such thing as autonomous churches. It was a movement. They were brothers and sisters. It was a brotherhood. And we need to be just as concerned about the disciples that were stranded down in San Diego and stranded in Moscow as we are about the disciples that are in our fellowship. Are you with me right here, guys? You know, next week, we're going to be having our financial presentation. I super appreciate Michael Kirshner organizing things and Yelena organizing Michael. That's awesome. But uh, next week, the call is going to go out. Prayerfully, after going through first principles, we don't have any more baby Christians. Now we've got people going on to maturity. 
oh yeah, we're going to have Danelle today. A amen. That's going to be awesome. But prayerfully going to go on to maturity. And often when people become a disciple or they place membership if they're restored, they only can give according to their faith. And, and, and frankly, they're not giving super sacrificially. They are for the moment. But after you've hung around the kingdom, after you've hung around the church, after you've hung around the movement, you start to understand we're not trying to build some cute little community church. We have the dream to evangelize the nations in this generation. And that's going to take sacrifice. And though sometimes we feel the recession here, it's nothing like in other places. We are a very rich city and a comparably rich church. And so this week, I really want you to pray. Elaine and I have already talked. I'm calling upon all the new disciples to significantly increase your giving. I'm calling upon all the older disciples, or dare I say more mature disciples, to increase your giving 10%. That's Elena's my pledge. And we're doing it side by side with you. Why? Because we believe in the dream. Let's go to Acts chapter 12. Zeal to pray. This is one of my favorite chapters. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. Now, this is the first of the apostles that are martyred. A lot of times we, we wonder, well, and we'll go on to see that Peter was put in prison and he escapes. But why was James allowed to be killed by a sovereign God? I think the answer to that is quite simple. No man dies for a lie. I'm sure it frightened the disciples a bit, but on the other hand, I think it made them all the more sure about their faith. Here's one of the apostles that's been preaching the resurrection of Jesus, the reality of Christianity. And he is willing to be beheaded for the cause. And you say, he believed. That makes me believe. You know, we had the privilege to go out to Washington, D.C. to encourage our sister church there these past couple of days and to not only bring them a message of encouragement, but Lynn and I wanted to introduce firsthand Carlos and Lucy Mejia and Jack and Jeannie McGee. And yeah, we said some nice things about Alpha too. But one of the things that I, I wanted them to understand, as I do with anybody going to any city, is I want them to understand their city. And so one of the things that I, I told Andrew, I said, we've got to take the Mejias to walk the mall in Washington. Now, the mall extends from the Lincoln Memorial to the reflection pool to, of course, the Washington Monument past more of the mall where the Smithsonian borders it on the right and left and then all the way to the Capitol. It's an incredible sight. When you get to the Washington Monument, if you look to the right, you'll see the Jefferson Memorial. If you look to the left, you'll see the White House. And it's been formed very purposely in a cross. It, Washington is the first planned city in America. And back then, the leaders believed in God. And it was, a, it was just, it was amazing to be there because we started out at the Lincoln Memorial. And it's, it's, it's just moving just to, to, to see Abraham Lincoln just sitting there with his speeches engraved on the side walls. What, what makes him such an incredible figure? He died for the dream that all men are created equal. His death punctuated his convictions. When you walk out from the veranda there, you come to the top steps. And engraved there are the words, this is where Martin Luther King spoke 
when he gave the speech, I have a dream. And if you've never seen a picture of the event, I mean, it's, it's breathtaking. You see Dr. King there on the steps, and you just see a sea of people surrounding the reflection pool. Why do we look in awe at that moment? Because it changed our history and the history of this planet. And he died, punctuating that dream. We walked the remaining of the mall, and we had prayer along the way. And I couldn't help but think and imagine just a few short months ago of President Obama's inauguration, built upon the dreams of Lincoln and King. When he stood at the opposite side of the mall there at the Capitol, he looked at a crowd that was far greater than others had looked at. The count was two million people had gathered there to hear him. And no matter what your political persuasion is, do not deny it's an amazing thing that we have an African American as our president. And today is kind of special for some of us that have been around a while. Today is the 46th anniversary of John F. Kennedy's death. I was in fifth grade, nine years old. I'll never forget it. We thought the dream had died. And yet when a man dies for his dream, then people understand that you don't die for a lie. Right here, James has died. And our faith should be strengthened even at this hour that he who was an eyewitness laid down his life believing that there was life beyond the grave. And so we read in verse 3. When Herod saw this had pleased the Jews, he proceeded to see Peter also. This happened during the Feast of Love and Bread, and after arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. I mean, there's 16 guys on Peter. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. I mean, their faith had been built up with James, but now the man that had become the leader amongst the apostles, Peter himself, the rock, was now in prison. And the church gathers together, and the Bible says... They were earnestly praying for his release. What are the odds? I'm sure somebody even prayed for James, but now he was beheaded. What are the odds that their beloved Peter could escape? We read on. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentry stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, and light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. See, in prison they were nude. As Peter did so, wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of prison, but he had no idea what the vision was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. He was having the most cranking dream, he thought. <laughs> this is a cranking dream. Finally got my clothes on. Whew. Verse 10. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading the city. It opened for them by itself and they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. And Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without doubt that the Lord sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were anticipating. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without opening, saying, Peter's at the door. You're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept on insisting it was so, they said, that must be his angel. But Peter kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet, and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell James and the brothers about this, he said, and then he left. For another place. These are our brothers and sisters. 
And perhaps it brings a smile to our face, but I think they're more like us than we think. Here they are, gathered at Mary's house. And what are they doing? The Bible says they're earnestly praying for Peter's release. All of a sudden, in the middle of this prayer session, they hear the knock. And you know how it is when you have a gathering. You always give it to the lowest person on the totem pole to go answer the door. (laughs) So you can see the nudge. Rhoda, which is kind of our name for Rose. Rose, honey, would you check see who's at the door? Okay. And, of course, she goes, who is it? It's me, Peter. Open the door. Oh, Peter. It's awesome. So she just doesn't open the door. She runs back on in. She goes, everybody, everybody, it's Peter's at the door. Peter's at the door. And some of the real strong brothers said, you are flat out of your mind, girl. We're praying for him right now. Now get serious. No, I'm telling you, he's at the door. Just tell her it's his angel. Okay, it's his angel maybe. All of a sudden they hear the... The pounding's getting really hard now. I'm hoping Peter didn't sin. I don't know. The Bible's silent there. <laughs> Finally, they open the door, and it's Peter, and they're astonished. Well, they're astonished that their prayers were answered. <laughs> Matter of fact, the commotion must have been pretty big because it's, okay, guys, let's be quiet. <laughs> Let me ask you, do you have some impossible prayers? I mean, but do you believe? That God's going to answer them. I remember when I first became a Christian. I so wanted my family to become a Christian. And I prayed to God. Nine months later, my younger brother got cancer. He was an existentialist. It broke him. Six months after that, I got to baptize him in the Lord. See, sometimes we, we have prayers, but they're just not answered the way we want to. Sixteen years after I became a Christian, my atheist grandpa died. I did the funeral, and my sister and I had a very intense talk about heaven and hell, life and death. One week later, she and her husband were baptized into Christ. You know, I've been praying for 16 years. What are your impossible prayers? I prayed for my three kids to be baptized, and they were baptized as disciples. Sadly, they'd fallen away, but I'm praying they're coming back. What are your impossible prayers? Don't stop. God hears. He may not answer your prayer in the way you expect it, but I'll guarantee you when he answers it, you'll be astonished. Well, look what happened here. It's a very important, almost footnote in verse 18. In the morning, there was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. After Herod had a thorough search made for him, he didn't find him. He cross-examined the guards and ordered that they be executed. When a Roman soldier allowed a prisoner to get free, he was killed. That's a very significant footnote for our further study in the next couple of weeks in the book of Acts. We find as we read on, Then Herod went from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there for a while. He'd been quarreling with the people of Tyre and Sidon. They were now joined together and sought an audience with him. Having secured the support of Blastus, a trusted personal servant of the king, they asked for peace because they depended on the king's country for food supply. On the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robe, sat on his throne, delivered a public address to the people. They shouted, this is the voice of a god, not a man. Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. You know what is awesome? the history books coincide with the Bible. Josephus writes, Herod on that day was struck down and eaten by worms and died. Honor God as God. Amen, guys? But look at this, verse 24. But the word of God continued to increase and spread. See, it wasn't like, oh, we plant one little autonomous church there, one little autonomous church. No, no, no. The word of God is increasing and it's spreading. It is a movement. Are you catching the vision here? Then yeah. a final footnote in verse 25. When Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, they returned from Jerusalem, taking along with them John, 
who's also called Mark. You say, well, well, we saw him first. We saw him first in verse 12, where it was the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark. No, that's not where you first saw John Mark. You saw him back in Mark chapter 14, verse 51. He was right there when they arrested Jesus. Mark himself writes about himself that there was a young boy standing there. That when he turned tail to run because of the arrest, someone grabbed his cloak and he ran away nude. That's where you first saw John Mark. Now, maybe you saw too much of him there. I don't know. But anyway, that's where you first saw him. But anyway. Next point. Zeal for the mission. Chapter 13. In the church at Antioch, there are prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, many who have brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called him. So after they fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them all. The two of them sent on their way by the Holy Spirit. You know, we need to understand that come January at our workshop, we may say that we're sending out the San Diego mission team. But biblically, and we need to have as a conviction, it's the Holy Spirit that's sending out Vic and Aurora and these brave souls. Amen, guys? This is a work of God. It is a miracle of God. It's an action of God. And we need to stand in awe of our God. Verse 5. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. Now, it's very interesting. John Mark is here. And we find out in Colossians 4.10 that he's Barnabas' cousin. We find out in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13, he's Peter's son in the faith. This is one of the hottest young disciples in Jerusalem. And he's accompanying Barnabas and Paul. The Bible says in verse 6, they traveled through the whole island and they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elamus, a sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elamus and said, You are a child of the devil, an enemy of everything that's right. You're full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind, and for a time you'll be unable to see the light of the sun. Immediately, mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. And the church said, Amen. Wow. This is their first stop. <laughs> notice, notice, Paul and Barnabas, when they start a church, they go after opinion leaders. People to convert who influenced so many other people. We'll talk about that at our next session more. Secondly, right here, we find in some ways a little bit of a humorous encounter. This uh, sorcerer, his name was Bar-Jesus, which means, Bar means son of Jesus. And Paul, seeing that he was trying to turn the proconsul away from the faith, says, your name is not Bar-Jesus, son of Jesus. You are Bar the devil. You are the son of the devil. And I'm going to flat strike you blind right now. <laughs> Strikes him blind. And then the proconsul believes, and we got a disciple that's a proconsul. Amen, guys? Pretty awesome. But look what happens in verse 13. From Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Pergian Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. One of the saddest notes in the whole early church. Here, the young hero of the church turns back. Because the way is too hard. Well, we find that Paul and Barnabas are not to be stopped. They go to Pisidian Antioch, and they preach the word there, and many people come to hear them. And we read in verse 44. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. When the Jews saw the crowd, they were filled with jealousy and talked abusively against what Paul was saying. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly. We had to speak the word of you. 
word of God to you first. Since you reject it, do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life. We now turn to the Gentiles, for this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord, and all who were appointed for eternal life believed the word of the Lord spread through the whole region. Wow. You remember the vision of Jesus from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And now, with a proclamation to the Gentiles, Paul is beginning to evangelize the ends of the earth. And we need to have it on our hearts to evangelize the ends of the earth. Amen, church? And notice the principle right here again. When you evangelize a population center like Pisidian Antioch, which is different than uh, the other Antioch, once you evangelize the population center, then the whole region hears the word of the Lord. Chapter 14, verse 1. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual in the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. But the Jews refused to believe, stirred up the Gentiles, and poisoned their mind against the brothers. Right here is a notation for all of us. It's one thing to share our faith. It's one thing to study with people, but we need to learn how to be effective in doing that. Amen, guys? And secondly, we need to understand that persecution will always follow. Verse 8. In Lystra, there sat a man crippled in his feet, who was lame from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him and saw that he had the faith to be healed and called out, Stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in Lyconian language, The gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought the bulls and reached the city gate, because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. Let's just stop right there. At first, this seems like an odd situation, but really not. We know from history that a Roman poet named Ovid wrote a, an, a, a book that was entitled Metamorphosis, or, or Change. And it's the story of Zeus and Hermes taking on human form and coming down to Lystra and that whole Laconian area. And what they want to do is to test the hearts of people. They go to a thousand homes. They ask for food and a place to stay, and a thousand people close the doors, supposedly, on their faces. And yet they come to one old couple named Philemon and Baucus. This older couple invites them in, feeds them, not knowing who they are, gives them a place to stay. And the next day, Zeus and Hermes reveal who they are, take them to the top of the mountain, and then a flood totally destroys the people that refused to see the gods. And so given that, we see right now that these people of Lystra aren't going to make the same mistake twice. Amen, guys? So we can learn from non-Christians. Amen? <laughs> Verse 14. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard this, they tore their clothes and rushed out in the crowd shouting, Men, why are you doing this? We two are only men human like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God, who made heaven and earth and sea and everything in them. In the past, he let the nations go their own way. Yet he's not left himself without testimony. He's shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in the season. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. Then some of the Jews from Antioch and Iconium won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up, went back into the city. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derby. Is that cranking or not? Right here, they stoned Paul because he was the speaker. And very often we want to stone the speaker because we feel that if we can kill the messenger, we'll stop the message, and that just wasn't the case. Some people believe that Paul actually died right here, and as the disciples gathered around and prayed for him, he was resurrected. Others think he was just a, a tough old buzzard of a guy that almost died. The disciples prayed for him. He gained strength. I'm of, I'm of that group. But what I love about Paul right here is after he gets stoned and after he's standing on his feet, he says, I want to go back into the city. Is that awesome or not? He just wanted to make his point. Now, he only stayed there one day because, you know, as tough as he was, he wasn't stupid. Amen, guys? Okay, so, Amen. 
You know, now we come to our last point, zeal for unity. In chapter 15, we find that Paul and Barnabas go down to Jerusalem to persuade the brothers, the Jewish brothers in Jerusalem, not to give in to the circumcision party who were saying, yeah, you have to have faith and you have to repent, you have to be baptized, but really, in order to be saved, you also have to then be circumcised. Well, then Peter comes into it at this big meeting and he says, I'm, I'm behind Paul and Barnabas. No, you don't have to be circumcised to be saved. And so we read in verse 12. The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul, telling about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done the, among the Gentiles through them. When they finished, James. Now, this James is the half-brother of Jesus. The apostle James has died. When they had finished, James spoke up, Brothers, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God at first showed his concern, taking from the Gentiles a people for himself. The words of the prophets in agreement with this, it's written, After this I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild, and I will restore it, that the remnant of men may seek the Lord, and that all Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things that have been known for the ages. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual morality, from meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogue on every Sabbath. Here was the most major decision in the early church. The date is about 49 A.D. There's this huge clash between the brothers. There's a circumcision party that says, you've got to be circumcised to be saved. Those that are with Paul and Barnabas say, no, you don't have to be circumcised. You are saved by faith. Peter gets behind Paul and Barnabas. But the one that makes the final decision is James, the half-brother of Jesus. I mean, it must have been pretty cool to have been there in the early church there in Jerusalem because James, I mean, genetically was half-related to Jesus. I mean, he would have looked a little bit like Jesus. Would that have been a little eerie or not? Ooh, that looks like Jesus. And the Bible says that through this time period, James the half-brother of Jesus, who writes the book of James, becomes the leader of the church. And when this issue is brought before all the apostles and all the elders, it's not put to a vote. Let me tell you something. The church is not the democracy of God. It is the kingdom of God. And right here, James, in one-man leadership, makes a decision for all the churches, both Jew and Gentile, and he says, this is my judgment that they do not have to be circumcised. We will send a letter to all the churches Amen. confirming this. Amen. And the church said, Amen. and by having that decision, it unified all the churches, both Jew and Gentile. Well, we conclude chapter 15 with this in verse 36. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the brothers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with him, but Paul didn't think it was wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Right here, it's a very sad chapter in the early church is the separation of Barnabas and Paul. Paul comes to Barnabas and says, hey, we've got to go back and visit the churches. They need strengthening. They need encouragement. Barnabas goes, absolutely. He says, can we take John Mark back with us? Paul says, absolutely not. And a lot of people have asked through, through the centuries, who was right, Paul or Barnabas? Well, one cannot escape in the scriptures that Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus. Barnabas was from Cyprus. He just sails and goes home. And it says, Paul chose Silas, who we see in verse 32 was a prophet. It's always good to have a prophet as your second-hand guy there. You know what I'm talking about? Paul chose Silas and left commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. It was Paul who was commended. It was Paul who was commended in building this mission team. 
So we understand that those people that are selected on a mission team are the strongest of brothers and sisters. And so Paul's convictions are scriptural and biblical. But one, I think, would be doing a great injustice to our brother Barnabas to say that he didn't have his heart in a good place for our weak brother, John Mark. You know, John Mark, he was the guy. He was the guy that we'll read about next time, Timothy. He was the young superstar, the son of the faith to Peter, the cousin of Barnabas. He was the guy that, that many people look to for leadership in the future. But he tanked it. He tanked it. Can, can you relate to tanking it? Yeah. People are counting you and you tank. Well, then you can relate to John Mark. You know, it's a very cool ending to the ministry of Paul. We'll close out with this in 2 Timothy chapter 4. <clears throat> Paul writes 2 Timothy near the end of 66 AD. He dies in early 67 AD by beheadment. And he writes 2 Timothy to, of course, Timothy. This is his last epistle, and Paul knows it's going to be. In verse 6, he talks about, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering. The time has come for my departure. He knows he's going to die. It's beginning to be winter. And he writes in verse 9 to Timothy, Do your best to come to me quickly. For Demas, because he's loved this world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Now, Demas was a preacher, and he falls away. Crescens has gone to Galatia and Titus to Demaltia. These guys were sent to those churches. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he's helpful to me in my ministry. I sent Tychius to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with at Carpus at Tros and my scrolls and especially the parchments. Right here, the only guy that was with Paul at this point was Luke. And yet, in this appeal to Timothy, who we all know that he loved Timothy so much, he says, Timothy, do your best to come to me quickly before I'm killed. He says, oh, yes, bring Mark, who's become helpful to my ministry. Wow. Paul was right about the mission team. And Barnabas was right about John Mark. He nursed him back to spiritual health. And God, in his grace, gave him a second chance. Paul desired but two people to be with him at the end, besides Luke, Timothy, and John Mark. Well, history holds that John Mark was faithful. He not only writes... The Gospel of Mark, which is the beginning of the Synoptic Gospels, the one based on the others. But we also we find recorded in history is that Mark shows where his convictions and his loyalties lie. Because in 70 AD, in the city of Alexander, Egypt, he too was martyred for the cause. See, bottom line, you don't die for a lie. Thank you.